Welcome, brothers and sisters. Also, a welcome to our friends, family, and travelers that are with us this morning. Welcome to the Brentwood Church of Christ morning worship service on this Lord's Day. We will mingle our hearts and voices in song and prayer. We will share the Lord's Supper to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Let us begin with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your kingdom which has come that we are part of. We thank you for the loving kindness that you have shown us in this congregation. We ask you to continue to guide and bless our leaders, our elders and deacons, and especially be with our teachers who instill in the young an interest and yearning for your will, your way, and your life. We ask that you would be with us each and every day this week as we begin our, our morning with a prayer and that we show an example. We are a light on the hilltop to the world, to our neighbors, and to our friends around us. Help us to always hold dearly in our heart the loving kindness that you showed to us in bringing your son to this world, him dying on the cross, and being risen the third day. And help us to always hold dearly in our hearts his promise that he will return one day for us. Be with us the rest of this hour as we worship you, we break the bread and drink the cup. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Let's all sing. O oh, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness burn, while the home of endless glory fills my heart. next song will be Walk With Me. Walk with me, walk with me, lest my eyes no longer see all the glory, all the story of your love. Talk to me, talk to me, like so tenderly when you talk there, when you walk there by the sea. Let me follow in the footsteps that trod the shore.
This morning, Brother Gary Orr will be bringing us a short message prior to our partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, before we do that, we're going to sing the first, third, and fourth stanzas of Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain. Bring to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in If you have not got the bread and the fruit of the vine, uh, please raise your hand and somebody will get that for you. In order to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, I want to read uh, Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord be revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as from one men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living? stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge 
shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion of the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many, and he makes intercession for transgressors. Let us pray. O Lord our God and Father in heaven, great and holy is your name. We thank you for your love towards us, and we thank you for your plan of salvation. As we as we take this time, as we take this bread, let us take our man, minds back to Calvary and to the sacrifice that was made by your son. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we continue our thanks for your love and we continue our thanks for the love of your son who came to this earth and died. And as we take of the, this fruit of the vine, may we remember the covenant for the forgiveness of our sins. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing before a lesson, We Shall Assemble. Following the singing of this song, I would ask that you remain standing, and we'll have our scripture reading at that time. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts and do his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. And with the angels up in heaven, 
We'll sing the song of victory. Glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. remain standing. Well, good morning. Our scripture reading this morning will be taken from Esther 4. It's a fairly long reading, and so if some of you need to sit down, you can feel free, but otherwise, let's go through this. The very first verse starts off with Mordecai hearing these things and tearing his clothes. Well, I had to know what was before that, so just a quick synopsis of what was going on. The children of Israel are under persecution under the Persian Empire right now. <clears throat> and so King Ahasuerus, who's the reigning king at this time, appoints kind of a worthless fellow, but his name is Haman, to, ru to rule over his kingdom and take care of all his things. So Haman's all full of himself, and he wants everybody to bow down, which is part of the king's edict. But Mordecai, with Esther, Mordecai does not bow down with Haman. So Haman gets furious. But not only does he want to do in Mordecai, he wants to, to do in all of the Jews. So he goes to the king, Haman does, and he says, listen, I'll give you $10,000 here in your, in, in your uh, um, whatever. And, um, but you know how money is. I'll give you $10,000 and I, will, I want all the Jews killed, all the Jews killed. And the king of Hazra says, okay, go ahead and do it. You can kill them all in one day. Now, can you imagine what they must have felt? So this is the pick, we'll pick this up here in chapter four. <clears throat> Let me get to it here. <clears throat> when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, Mordecai put on sackcloth and ashes and went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to go into the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was a great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to close Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn why was this all happening. Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries, that was the word I was trying to think, for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain to her the uh, explain to her and command her to go to the king and beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of the people and Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said and Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king in the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death. Except for the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter, he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to the king in these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai <coughs> told them to reply to Esther. <coughs> Do not think yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than any other Jews. For if you keep silent this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days or nights I and my young women will do the same. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. And if you're lucky, Jaron will let us know the rest of the story. 
Please be seated. I should have just given Wes the first two pages of my notes. He summarized it perfectly for me. Uh, so it, it's always a pleasure to be given the opportunity to come and speak before you today. If you will, keep your Bibles open to Esther chapter 4. Uh, we'll be spending most, if not all, of our lesson within this chapter. Um, and so I was asked on Thursday if I could step in because Stephen was out sick. And I was sitting there trying to figure out what I wanted to talk on. And there are two things that kind of have been sitting on my mind a lot lately lately. And I kept kind of coming back to, so that's what we're going to look at today. And that is this concept of faith versus fear and how it relates to the book of Esther. I heard it said once that the definition of faith and the definition of fear are the same. Believing that which you cannot see will come to pass. Again, the definition of faith and the definition of fear are the same. Believing that which you cannot see will come to pass. The difference is one drives us to action while the other drives us to avoidance. As I was reading through Esther, this statement kept coming to my mind and how it plays into the plot of this story. Each moment there are key decisions made and key circumstances that happen which lead to the deliverance of God's people. But it all hinges on the actions and the faith of Mordecai and Esther. And so we're going to look through and kind of key in on this moment, Esther chapter 4, and see how this concept of faith and this concept in fear play into how this story looks and how it ends. And so how did we get to where you read? Wes summarized this pretty well, uh, but leading into chapter 4, what do we have happening here? The Jews are in captivity. They're taken to a land of Persia where a man named Ahasuerus is ruling. And the book opens with Ahasuerus throwing a massive half-year-long party to show his wealth, to show his generosity. And during this, he invites the queen to the party to show her off. And she declines, though, which makes him angry, and in his rage, he decides to fire her as queen. Chapter 2 leads into him searching for a new queen because he realized he wanted one there. And he starts a beauty pageant for all the young women in the area, of which he would pick the one that he found most beautiful that pleased him the most. And as he's going through this, we're introduced to two Jews that lived in the area, one named Mordecai and his niece Esther. So Mordecai, we find, enters Esther into this competition to become queen, he forbids her to tell of her background and nationality. And then we find later on that Esther is chosen to become queen. Everything is looking to go relatively well. However, in chapter 3, we find a turn for a worse. A man named Haman is introduced. He's a high-ranking official with a relatively big head. The king elevates him to second in command, and because of his position, puts out an edict that all men should bow. Mordecai, because of his faith as a Jew, refuses to bow to Haman. And this enrages him to the point that he not only wants to destroy Mordecai, but also wants to destroy all of his people as well. And so what he does is he goes and he gets the king to sign an order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all of the Jews, young, old, men, women, children, on the 13th day of the 12th month. And this is the stage that is set as we enter in to Esther chapter 4. And I'm going to reread for us verses 1 through 13 as we enter into this discussion of Esther chapter 4. It begins again in verse 1. When Mordecai had learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate close in sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. And men, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, the, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend to her. And she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathach went to Mordecai into the city square, as in one, it was in front of the city's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that he might command her to go into the king and make supplication to him and plead before her people. 
So Hathach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman that go into the inner court to the king who have not been called, he has but one law, to put all to death, except those whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these thirty days. So they told Mordecai Esther words, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the Jews. So we find in this moment, in these, past, or in these verses we just read, we're hitting a very big crossroads in this story. The decisions made in these next few verses are going to shape not only the rest of this book, but a large piece of the Jewish history at this time moving forward. It is all contingent on how they decide to respond, whether it be out of fear or whether it be out of faith. And for a moment, let's walk through, in a sense, a hypothetical situation. Let's put on a mindset of if you were in this position. Put yourself in the shoes of just the typical Jew in the kingdom at this time. So you're a captive in a foreign land. You're finally starting to get comfortable getting your feet under you. You're walking about. Life is looking relatively good. It's a random Tuesday. The sun's shining. You're walking into the market because you forgot some groceries for dinner. You go in. You're walking around, talking to people. You pick up the things that you need. And out of the corner of your eye, you see one of the king's servants. And you see that he has an announcement that he is making, so you go over to here. And as you get closer, you hear him announcing to the people, on the 13th day of the 12th month, all Jews are to be annihilated, destroyed, and killed, and are allowed to be plundered. All citizens, please make preparations for this day. Again, all citizens, on the 13th day of the 12th month, I hereby decree that all Jews, men, women, and children, are to be annihilated, killed, and destroyed, and are allowed to be plundered. Please make preparations for this day. Your gut drops, because that's talking about you. Your mind spins, fear takes over your body. What do you do? You freeze because you know there's nowhere you can go. The kingdom spreads all the earth. Even if you try to hide or run away, there's not much hope for you to do it. There's no escape. The future is set. You, your family, and your friends are going to die. Now take a step back. Now think about yourself as Mordecai in the situation. You're sitting outside the gates. You see this man named Haman that walks by. You know that you're supposed to bow to him, but because you're a Jew, you recognize that you only bow to God. Because of your faith, you don't do this. You know what makes him upset. You don't know how upset it makes him. You find out as the decree comes out one day that he has decided to not only try and kill you, but to kill all of your people. As you're sitting in the court and you hear it announced, all citizens, on the 13th day of the 12th month, I hereby decree that all Jews, men, women, children, are to be annihilated, killed, and destroyed, and are allowed to be plundered. Please make preparations for this day. Your heart breaks because you realize it's because of your decisions not to bow that this has come across or come to your people. You realize with a slight slimmer of hope that Esther is queen and that she is one of your people, but you realize that it's not fair to ask her to risk her life for a decision that you've made. You weep and you mourn, your peace is gone as your heart is broken and hope is lost because their kingdom spreads all the earth. Where is your refuge? Where is your God? There is no longer any hope. There is no escape. The future is set. You're all going to die. Now put yourself in Esther's shoes, sitting on the throne. You don't know what's going on. You just know that Mordecai for the past two weeks has been weeping and wailing in sackcloth outside of the gates. You wonder, why are they weeping? Why are they so troubled? What is going on? You send people to ask Mordecai what is troubling you, and he sends back the news. He sends back the edict for you to read. All citizens, on the 13th day of the 12th month, all Jews are to be annihilated, killed, and destroyed, and their goods to be plundered. Please make preparations for that day. Your heart breaks inside, but knowing that you have to keep your identity a secret as Mordecai had commanded, you can't let it show. You've worked too hard for too long to keep your identity hidden, and especially now that you've heard the news, the risk is even higher. He asks you to go into the king's court and plead on behalf of your people, but you know that you can't, for walking in is certain death. That's against the law, and there are no second thoughts with this king. We saw what he did with Vashti when she did as little as refused to come to your party. How much more if I show up and break this law without his calling? There is no hope, for if I go, I will die, 
If I stay, my life may be preserved, but my people will die. There is no escape. The future is set, and all will die. In this moment, with these mindsets, let's think through how this story would end. Taking this mindset and believing that which we cannot see, that this end is imminent, what would that have looked like if they worked out of an attitude of fear? So putting us in this position, the news has been spread, and in the days, months leading up to this, we find that many are trying to flee the kingdom, but very few are successful. The borders are closed as people are fleeing. The king clamps down and issues another edict to kill all the Jews who try to escape on the spot. Mordecai, who used to always be in the gates proclaiming his faith, is now just a shell of what he was as his hope is gone and his spirit is broken. Esther, in the meantime, has become dangerously paranoid as she seeks to keep her identity hidden. And the words of Mordecai echo in her head in verse 13, where he says, Do not think that because you are in the king's house that you alone of all the Jews will escape. Wherever she looks, she sees those who she thinks knows about her secret, and she slowly drives herself mad. All of those around her are wondering what has become of that beautiful and kind woman we once knew. Finally, the day arrives and the slaughter commences. Mordecai doesn't even try to fight back, for his spirit is broken, and he is ready for his fate. A people that Esther could have saved all fall, thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And this thought haunts her day and night, driving her further and further into the sadness and madness. She can't go on, and she comes to an untimely end, weeping, telling a servant, and facing his fury for not revealing her identity. And thus is the story of Esther. This is the story told through the mindset of fear, where they believed what they could not see would come to pass, and with death staring them in the eyes, they looked their fate, and they saw it as something that was imminent, and let hope be lost. It was a very sad end. But luckily, this is not how the story plays out. If you will look back at Esther chapter 4, we'll be reading verses 14 through 17. Again, Esther chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. We pick up with Mordecai talking, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go and gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night and day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all, to all that Esther had commanded him. And so we see here how they acted through faith. Believing in that which he could not see, we see Mordecai's faith. With death staring him in the eyes, he recognized that God is bigger, and he believes that God will not fail. God will deliver his people. His faith recognizes the situation and drives him to take action. He sends word back to Esther, telling her, No matter what you do, we will be delivered, whether through you or through other means. But what if you were placed here for such a time as this? And we see what his act of faith does then in Esther. In verses 15 through 17, we see how her mindset shifts. In verse 11, we have her bringing word back, saying, If I go, I will certainly die. I will not go. But in verses 15 through 17, we find that because of his words of encouragement, she accepts that, yes, the fear of death is present, but this is the only option, and the Lord will use me to deliver. And in a great demonstration of faith, she proclaims, if I perish, I perish. And from this moment, from these actions, and from this declaration of faith, stem the rest of the course of the book. We see that they took action. That Esther goes before the king to intercede for her people, that God brings favor over her, and God brings about the favor of, uh, of the king over Mordecai as well, bringing him honor in the king's court. Thus, through their faith and through their action, God puts them in a position to change the course of history, to write a law that will let the Jews fight back, preserving their lives and overcoming their enemies. And when that day finally arrives, we find that these acts of faith then stir on the Jews to act in faith and overcome through the grace of God, turning the initial intent of the proclamation on its head leading to Haman and his house being destroyed rather than Mordecai and his people. We find that through their faith, God used them to bring about the deliverance of his people, proclaiming his power and his glory over all through them. They believed fully in what they could not see, an end where God is glorified and his people are delivered. Then they took action and, glorified, and God glorified himself in them through it. And so how do we take this story and this mindset and how do we apply it to ourselves? Uh, I once read a book 
called The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. He's an old Christian writer. And one of the quotes, I adapted it a little bit, goes along the lines of this. It is better to walk forward with the fear of death and the hope of deliverance than to stay where death is certain. We find this shown with Esther as she moves forward with the fear of death going before the king, but knowing that God would deliver rather than staying and doing nothing where death is imminent. And taking on this mindset is what we need to do as people. And these words are great for me to tell you, but it's very difficult to walk this out. It's all well and good for me to come up here and say that we are to act in faith, that we are to move forward and march on, to be the foundation of faith as Mordecai was, setting the launching pad for others to take action, or to be like Esther, walking in the face of death and delivering her people. But it's hard to come up here and tell you to do something that I'm not very good at myself. More often than not, for myself, I have found in these situations played out much more like the first scene that we've painted. For fear of the things much less than death, I've stood back and watched people continue on a path to destruction rather than standing up. You felt the weight of knowing just maybe God has placed you here to intersect someone's life at this moment, to bring them deliverance from something much greater than simply a physical death. But for fear of things much less than dying, I've oftentimes stood back and watched those who could have been delivered continue on a path to destruction. I know that if I remain silent, God will bring deliverance from another place because he is greater than any of my unbelief. But what if we were put here for such a time as this? My position as a child of God doesn't protect me from this responsibility as it didn't protect Esther to be queen from her responsibility. If anything, it adds to it. If I remain silent, God will deliver his people and it will rise from another place for he is bigger than unbelief. But it doesn't bring much comfort for finding when Mordecai addresses this in his statement. He says, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. An equivalent for this for us is James 4.10, he who knows to do good and does not do it, it is a sin. I say all that to say this, that we have a calling to bring deliverance, the deliverance of God to the people around, testifying as Peter testified to all, be saved from this perverse generation. We're blessed with the fact that even in the worst circumstances within this country, the worst that we have is much less than the fear of death. What is keeping us, and what is keeping us frozen in fear, what is holding us back? And again, for this, I can only speak for myself. For fear of destroying a relationship that I may not know how to handle, for fear of no longer being preferred in their sight by saying the hard things, for fear of having to actually take a stand on something that I disagree with, for fear of confrontation, for fear of the awkwardness between me and whoever that discussion may be with. The excuse is very easy on the other end of this as well. Believing that which I cannot see will come to pass, I tell myself that my words will mean nothing anyways, that I cannot change their mind, that they're going to do what they're going to do, whether I say something or not. And with all of this, I can avoid the uh, discussion, I can skirt around, I can remain where death is certain and leave them on their path to destruction. And that is why this chapter, this lesson in the story has weighed so heavy on me and why I bring it to you today. This is a call for both myself and for you to take courage, as Esther did, to be bold, to stand in the face of fear, and to act. To realize that God will bring deliverance for his people, but how does he do it? He does it through you. He does it through me. He does it through our faith. Let this lesson serve as a Mordecai for you to go before the king and to deliver his people as only we can through faith. If you have yet to obey the gospel, this also applies to you all the same. How long will you stay with death, where death is certain? And how long will you avoid answering the call to obey from fear of what may come of it? The path isn't easy. The fear of death certainly lies on the other side of this commitment. It calls for transformation, obedience, submission in ways that you may have never dreamed of. It will challenge you, press you, and grow you in ways that you can't imagine. And it can be and is a very scary thing to take on the name of Christ. Yet even more fearful is to stay where death is certain where judgment has been pronounced and where there is no escape from the death that is coming except through Christ. So come today and be delivered through Christ and to walk in the grace that only he can give. If we can stand and help you in any way, let God be your guide, let your faith lead to action, and come forward and let us help you as we stand and sing. Yeah.
should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Please forgive us for me. His mercies, mercies for you and for me. Come on. Just a moment, Andrew Sullivan will lead us in a closing prayer. So good to see everyone this morning. We do have some visitors with us. We appreciate very much you being here and hope that you can come back and be with us again. Uh, one note, I want everyone to know that this morning the internet service was down here in the building, so we were not able to stream our service this morning in case someone asks you about that. Uh, Jaron's lesson was recorded, so it will be uploaded to the website. I want to thank Jaron for filling in on short notice this morning. Appreciate that very much. Appreciate very much all our Bible class teachers. Uh, you mean so much to all of us. You do such a great job, and it's very important. Thank you to the men who helped us to worship this morning. Uh, we, we learned that Eleanor Davenport fell at her home on Friday, had to go to the hospital. Uh, I don't have an update on her. I think she was hoping to go home today. So hopefully she's doing well enough to be able to go home. We learned yesterday that Brooke Firm's uncle, Dave Flatt, was diagnosed with tongue cancer. So uh, let's be praying for uh, Dave Flatt, for Brooke's family, uh, as he goes through treatments for the cancer. We're excited to announce this morning that Hanish Dael met with the elders this morning and he wants to be a part of our church family, and he's excited about that, and we're excited to have Hanish. Hanish is back here in the very back in the blue shirt, standing next to Jesse Pope. If you've not had a chance to meet Hanish, please be sure to do that and welcome him to our family. It's, a, it's another school year starting up. Uh, some may have already started. Uh, others will be starting soon. Uh, we want to be prayerful about the children and families. Uh, times are kind of different in schools, different than they used to be, certainly different than they were when I was uh, going to school. A lot of challenges for the families, so let's, let's be mindful of them as they start another school year. We have some college students who are headed back to the classrooms uh, this month. 
uh, some very soon, some a little later, some are local, some are uh, maybe in state, out of state, may, or even out of the country. So <laughs> uh, let's be mindful of them as they leave. We want to encourage you college students as you, as you do leave and, and head back to school to continue to let your light shine and uh, know that God is with you uh, no matter where you are. You may or might, may not have noticed this morning, but Abby Orr is wearing a shiny new ring. We want to congratulate Andrew Sullivan and Abby Orr on their engagement. It's very exciting, I know, for them and for their families and, and for all of us who have known them so long. On Wednesday night, Shane Scott delivered a powerful and moving lesson on dealing with tough times. We know that if we live long enough, all of us will experience tough times. Many of you are dealing with tough times right now. It was a very timely lesson. Um, Shane talked about Paul and all the difficulties he faced in his life, uh, uh, persecutions both mentally and physically, things that he had to deal with. In 2 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul talked about how he received a thorn in the flesh and then he pleaded with God three times to take it away. And God's response was, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness which led Paul to say, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Shane reminded us that when we are going through tough times, if we will go to God, that God will comfort us and he will humble us and he will cause us to focus on what is important in this life. Uh, Paul also told the Corinthians what a difficult time he and his traveling companions had had as they traveled through Asia. He said, we were crushed and overwhelmed. We thought we would never live through it. In fact, we thought we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. In tough times and good times, we need to put our confidence in God, not in ourselves. Don Truex, Lord willing, will be with us this Wednesday night from Tampa, Florida, as we continue our summer series. Hope everyone has a great week. Andrew, would you lead us in a closing prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to worship you this morning, um, pray to you, sing to you, and hear a message from your word. We pray that um, with that encouragement, we can strive to serve you in everything we do, that we can share your word with others um, and, and bear that out as an example. We pray that um, as I and many other students here start, start back soon, um, whether that be younger kids or um, college students, that we um, can take the example that we, we know we should have and, um, and bring that into the classroom and show other people Christ and take the environment that we're in as an opportunity um, to help others. As we talked about in class this morning, help us to have the right perspective on life and understand what will truly be fulfilling to us and seek your will um, and fear you and keep your commandments and help us to avoid um, trying to fill a void with um, that we might feel with worldly things and rather try to fill that by seeking you. As we heard in the message this morning, help us to act with urgency in furthering the gospel and help us to understand the the impact that we can have to others around us um, by, by our actions and our behavior. Thank you for all the physical blessings we have and help us to understand that those things are temporary and that um, our faith and our confidence should be in you. Be with us this week and keep us safe and help us to seek you and um, strive to live with the and have the peace and grace that, that you have promised us. And 
um, in all these things we pray in your son's name amen